Why don't we uh, join together in prayer in the room and online. Lord, we just thank You uh, for Charles' story. We thank You that he is testimony of Your grace and what You wanna do in the lives of not just him, but everybody. And we thank You that You are removing obstacles in our way so that we can serve You wholeheartedly and be a gift to this world. We pray that You bless Char, but also Lord, we've come here today to worship You because we love You. You are our Father and we wish to do Your will. So Lord, as we open Your Word, Word. We know that it is sharp, that it is effective and that it gets uh, into the deep places of our life. So we open ourselves up today and we say, Lord, may we be different today because of what you're wanting to share with us. In Jesus' Name, Amen. 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 Take your seats. Well, of course, it is Father's Day today. And uh, I know around when, when Father's Day is coming up because I start getting holes in my socks because I run out of cologne and because uh, my undergarments get a little bit loose with their elastic. And I'm like, okay, it's about time it's Father's Day. I need these gifts coming towards me. And so usually there's about a month gap where, where I've run out of cologne. And I'm just like, instead of going out to buy some, I just need to wait for my wife to get me some. And she came through with the goods today, got me a big bottle. And uh, it wasn't that she thinks I'm unhygienic. She just gets to pick the way that I smell. I guess that's being married, isn't it? And... Uh, and, and so it, it's fantastic. Um, and we think about my own dad and, and his example to me, uh, my own dad who, who lost his father when his father died when he was young and was able to overcome those challenges to be a great dad. And I re so respect that. Uh, and I haven't had that, having a, a dad who loves being a dad. And, and I'm so lucky to have that uh, and, and be able to build on that example. I think no matter who our dad is, um, our challenge is to do things even better and build on the legacy that we've been given, whether it be a small um, gift and, and, or, or a large gift. And, and whatever it is, today's a day where we, we wade through all the, the good, bad and the ugly and we try and find the good. And I think that's what we try and do on a day like today, isn't it? And um, well, today we are continuing our series uh, called Kingdom Calling. And the title of my message today is... Called, that we are called to greatness. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are the greatest of all time. You are the goat. You're the greatest of all time. Um, this, morning, this morning I got up, um, I didn't have a sleep in this morning because obviously I was, I was getting, getting myself ready for the message and Daniel woke me up at 6.30ish, um, went in, turned the coffee machine on and I had a choice of mugs to choose from. I've got my favourite mugs, the one that the coffee just tastes that little bit better from. I don't know what it is, but there's some that are better than others. But there was this one mug that said, world's most amazing dad. And I went straight for that mug and I think today, I'm gonna believe that for myself. I'm gonna choose that. It's always best when you say it yourself, I find. Um, awkward, uh, awkward laughter. <laughs> um, uh, you might have heard this quote before. It was Andy, Pastor Andy Stanley who adapted it from somebody else uh, where he talked about greatness. And he says this, the greatest contribution to the Kingdom of God that you make may not be something that you do or accomplish or work towards, but it might be someone you raise. What a great quote. And because that tells us that it's not just about accomplishment and that there are things about greatness that are more just being the top of your field. And of course, this is the bit within the church that we get right. We kind of get this. Um, on the inside, we're not just shooting for uh, things, temporary things. We know that there are things more important uh, than just what we can do with our hands. But when we talk about great, greatness, um, you think of sports heroes. Uh, think of the famous speeches by Muhammad Ali. And uh, I am the greatest. And uh, was that a, was, how did I go with that? Great, great. You think of, think of sports stars, people at the top of their field. Um, but of course, Jesus uh, paved a different way and, and He turned, even though that's our culture, we talk about what greatness is and we have a version of what that is. And in Jesus' culture, it was very different. Um, he was born into a very religious culture where what it meant to be great 
uh, in the Roman world and in the Jewish world was quite different today, but Jesus turned greatness on its head. He redefined what greatness was all about. And my first point for us today, taking notes, I've got two main points. Somebody praise the Lord. (laughs) That great people have time for nobodies. Great people have time for nobodies. You know, in some uh, industries and in some aspects of society that greatness is seen as climbing the ladder, the higher that you can go, the more promotions that you can get, the more successful that you are. It's almost this upward mobility, this upward movement to get to the top. That is what greatness is. But what Jesus came to show is not about how high you can climb, it's how low you can bend. And it wasn't about using people around you and and having relationships and mixing with the right people and and having the right connections and, and, and budding up and scratching the right backs so that they can scratch yours so that you can get further on in life. He was about, oh, I'm not just about hanging out with the somebodies. He's saying, Jesus came to show us and what Jesus came to do is He came to treat the nobodies as somebodies not just to hang around with the people who are already somebodies. In Luke chapter nine, we've got this, the famous uh, scripture that I'd love to read together is quite different to some of the uh, ego stroking that goes on in our culture. Of course, this was in a, a religious setting and the disciples were, were their hearts and they were fervent and they were highly religious and they were committed to being faithful to God and serving Him with their whole life. This was why they were following Jesus. This is why they had given up things to do what they were doing. They were deeply devoted, deeply committed and deeply zealous uh, religiously. So they started to have this argument and we'll pick it up in Luke chapter nine. As they were talking about these things, an argument started among the disciples to which of them would be the greatest. Everyone say greatest. Greatest. I'm the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside them. He said to them, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least, that is who is the greatest. Jesus flips what is the greatest on on its head. And He said, it's not the one who climbs to the top. It's not the one who accomplishes the most. It's not even the one who is the most zealous, committed. It is the one who is least. It is the one who welcomes this little child. You see, Jesus was known in His ministry for going to the nobodies. This is what makes Jesus great. And, he, and He's having to flip the script and He's having to redefine greatness. And not only was He preaching about it, but He's also demonstrating it. And this is all throughout the Gospels where Jesus said, hey, I still want you to be great. There's just a different way to be great. Um, we see this right from the very start as Jesus was born, the, the Christmas story that the King was born, the Saviour of the world, the long expected Jewish Messiah. And you know who the angels went to first? You know who was the most valuable, the VIPs who God thought really needs to know the news first? Who was it that had the news? The shepherds, the angels. The angels from heaven visited the shepherds on the hill and they announced the good news. And here's the thing about the shepherds, they were social outcasts. They weren't people of high standing. They weren't the religious elite. They weren't the social elite. They weren't, they weren't the people who were at the top of the ladder. They were at the people at the very bottom of the ladder. So God cares about the nobodies and He announced that right at the birth of Jesus. We also see this in Jesus' ministry that of course He didn't just spend time with nobodies. In fact, He spent time with everybody. And, and what a way that is to approach life, to be somebody who can mix with people from all tiers of society, all walks of life. That's who we wanna be. And in fact, Jesus um, had that encounter with the woman, the Samaritan woman. Do you know the story? Um, The woman who had five wives and the man who was living with her at the time wasn't... You know the story, that's why I said you know the story. 
I like it, we can be interactive. Um, this may not be the last time where I need your input. <laughs> the husband, the man who she was living with wasn't even her husband. And so Jesus speaks into this life. And so we, we see that in that interaction that this woman wasn't of high standing in, in society based on her own history and her background and her choices, whatever it was that would happen in her background. But not only that, she was a Samaritan, which means we know a little bit about the Samaritans that they were seen as spiritual compromisers. They didn't believe the right things. They didn't worship in the right way. And so this was not the kind of people who would think that God is most pleased with. But see, it was to this kind of person that Jesus spoke with, He made time instead of going around as people were accustomed to do, so they weren't compromising as well. He went straight to that place. He, he met that woman, He spoke and dignified that woman. But not only that, He had this amazing encounter with her. And you may not be aware of this, but it was the, one of the most, I think it's the clearest self declarations that He is the Son of God and the first time certainly that He reveals this part of His nature, He could have revealed this to anyone, but He chose this interaction with this nobody to give such a beautiful picture of He was, so clear. And we read it in the passage uh, in, in John 4, where, where they talk about the living water and, and where, where she talks about the right worship. And then the woman says this, I know that Messiah that He's coming. And when He comes, He will explain everything to us. And then Jesus looks her in the eye and He says this clear statement of who He is. It's amazing revelation that few people got to hear that directly. He said, then Jesus declared, I, the one who's speaking to you, am He. I am He. So He's saying, I am this Messiah. He's directly saying it. I don't know if there's too many places in the New Testament where He's being this He's giving this clear revelation. Why is He doing that? He's saying, you are, you are not just a nobody, you are a somebody. You are the kind of person that I love. You are the kind of person that I value. Jesus is saying, this is what it means to be great, to treat nobodies as somebodies. It's not just being the king. It's not just being the top of your field. It's not just accomplishing the most. The kind of greatness that God is after is people who are willing to take time out of their busy schedule to give time of day to people who the world calls nobodies. And I mean, sometimes being great in the Kingdom of God is uncomfortable. Sometimes being great in the Kingdom of God means, means taking time out of your busy schedule to treat somebody with dignity. I wonder, how do you how do you treat, how do you have time for, for all sorts of different people in your life? Do you have time for them? I think one of the reasons we don't have time sometimes is that um, it, it, it takes time. It takes investment. It takes sacrifice to live that way. That there's people in our lives, you know, sometimes there, there are givers and there's takers. Often there's win-wins in our life, isn't there? Um, where where we, we're nice to somebody, we do something for someone, they'll give it back. But there are also people in our life that just take from us. That's just investment. And I think that's the challenge for us. How do, we, how do we treat those people who it's just pure sacrifice? Great people have time for nobodies. Uh, have you heard, you, have you heard like I do that um, recently there's, there's oh, it was some, some really highbrow magazine article or something that I was reading, but it was talking about how dad bods are, uh, Dad bodies, some of you may not be familiar with that term, but dad bods um, are, are attractive to women these days. I think that cannot be true. <laughs> that cannot be true. But I, I think it's definitely a dad with a dad bod who's written that article. Um, but I, I love that. I love that because when I see a dad bod and a large midsection of a, of a father, I don't see someone who's been um, poorly disciplined has been eating too bad. What I see is a symbol of sacrifice for the family. I see somebody who's given up their rights, given up their spare time, given up all sorts of things to, to sacrifice for their family. And yes, that has shown itself in their body. Yes, they may not get enough time to exercise and eat right. And, 
but that's just a sign of their love and their devotion for their family. Man, do you receive that? I think it, wear it as a symbol of pride. The dad bod, the donut, the keg. Um, I need to lose some weight. Um, But here's the thing, I share that silly example because there's some truth in it. There's some truth in it that that when you become a father, you willingly give up some of your freedoms for the sake of others. And this is what Jesus was all about. And He said, this is what love is all about. Love, agape, is sacrificial love. And my second point for us, my last point, is that great people wash other people's feet. Not only are great people spend time and make time for nobodies, but they also wash each other's feet. Let's read together in in John 13 from verse three, that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power and that He had come from God and He was returning to God. I love this passage because it talks about who Jesus knew that He was. His mission was clear. He, he knew His identity. He was in right relationship with the Father. He wasn't trying to win the approval of others because He had the approval of heaven. He Himself, of course, was God, but He didn't need those things. He didn't need to prove Himself to anyone else. And it's out of that verse three that the power for verse four comes from. And in verse four, it says this, so, He got up from the meal. He took off his outer garment and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he took the role of what was a servant in that culture, a lowest standing of person who, because they were involved with unclean practices, someone who had no status of their own, potentially someone who was a slave. He took on that role and after that, he poured the water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, he was shocked with with that and he says, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? He's saying, Lord, you are great. Jesus, you are great. Great people are honoured. Great people climb the ladder. I know what great people are. You are, I want you to know, Jesus, that you are great. And Jesus is saying, I have something very different to teach you, Peter. Very different to teach you, my disciples. In fact, this is one of the reasons that I have come to show you what true greatness looks like. That the God of heaven, the King of heaven in human flesh is not just great because He's the roaring lion, He's also the lamb. He's not just the one who wields the scepter of power, who is holy, who is mighty, who is untouchable, but He's also the God who stooped down from heaven, who took on human flesh, who kings should be bowed down before, but Jesus here is bowing low to take on the role of a slave and a servant. You see, being Great in the kingdom of God can sometimes cost you a lot, can sometimes look like serving when you receive nothing in, it, in, nothing in it for you. And there are times when we're confronted by this kind of situation in our own life is, am I going to serve or am I going to choose not to serve because it doesn't help me? And I think we wanna fight against that culture in our own culture is saying that the what's in it for me culture that the time sometimes we wanna serve and we wanna do good things to people is because we know there's a little bit of a kickback for us. Maybe I won't, I won't gain something explicitly, but I'll look better and greater in the eyes of other people. That it's helping, helpful for my reputation if I help others. Or there's, it's helpful for my reputation if I do the right things so that other people can think I'm a right person. But true service is giving yourself to other people for the benefit of other people without gaining anything for yourself. This is what spiritual giants do. And when I look out to the people here, I can see, I can see spiritual giants. You're not preachers, you're not 
Your name's not up in lights. People were not raving about you. But I wanna say that if you are serving, if you are spending time with people, that, the, the nobodies, if you're giving yourself in service behind closed doors that no one knows about, I wanna say that you're a spiritual giant, that there is greatness in you. As you are like Jesus in these ways, you are considered great in the Kingdom of God. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? That no matter what other people may think about you, God's agenda for your life is better. That we are called to the nobodies and we're called to wash people's feet. How can we wash people's feet in our life? I don't know, I wanna leave that up to you. What, what acts of kindness, what acts of service, what acts of giving can you do? These are the things that God says to be excellent at. As Paul is talking to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he, he, he says, excel in the gift of giving. Hey, I want you to be great. This is not an idea of, this is not the idea that don't, don't work hard in your job. Don't, don't try and um, be excellent at school or university. Do those things. But there are some things that I want you to excel at that other people in our culture are not excelling at. He says, excel in the grace of giving. Isn't that beautiful? Be great at those things. Be great at humility. Be great at loving people. Loving God and loving people. Why don't we stand together as the band comes and joins, joins me on stage? We are called to be great, but not like Muhammad Ali, not like Michael Jordan. Not like Elon Musk. However, there might be a young Elon Musk in training, one of our primary school kids. I wanna believe the best for you. May you take over the world. And may we have Christians that are the richest men and women in the world for the Kingdom of God, amen. amen. Can I just share a story before I close? Is that okay? Um, I remember working so hard. I think it was a, a 19 or 20 year old. I had a, just had a, a low paying part-time job while I was at university. And so money was very tight. I was living out of home, eating uh, two minute noodles a lot. And uh, yeah, you should feel sorry for me. That's right. <laughs> and uh, money was tight. And, but there was this one item that uh, I really wanted. I'm, I love music, love listening to music. And so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna save up for a, a portable music player. And, and so I saved and worked hard and saved up my dollars and put it away. What is it, the, the eight, save? What's, what's Pastor Bill's breakdown, the, the 50, 40, 10? I don't know what the 50, 40, 10 is, but you should give your 10 to church. I know that bit. And, and, uh, and so I was saving my money and, uh, and I, had, I did all my research. And there were, two, there were two options. There was this relatively unknown and, and new technology called the Apple iPod. You might've heard of it. And there was that option and it had, uh, had a pretty small screen and it was, looked a bit clunky, the early versions. And, and then I stumbled across this beautiful machine. It was slimline, um, brushed steel, large screen ergonomic buttons. It, it was beautiful. In fact, I think we've got a picture of it up on screen, do we? It was called the Zune. It was called the Zune. And uh, if we don't have that picture, this is gonna be not as great. No, we don't have it. You can, you can look it up on your, your iPod. Um, and I, I chose, I'm like, okay, I did my research, chose the Zune. And I paid for it, got it. Got it in the mail. I'm like, this thing is beautiful. And then when I opened out the box and tried to get it started, I realised that it didn't work in Australia. That all my research was based on America, that it had this iTunes thing and I couldn't actually get any music on it. It looked beautiful, but it was no good. <laughs> and I'd made the wrong choice and I'd worked, oh, I'd worked hard, I'd saved hard to get, get the wrong thing. And why I share that story is that sometimes in life, 
we can be just like this, that we can spend all our time and our energy and our resources and our focus and our goals can all be pointing towards the wrong goal. I chose the wrong goal and I chose the wrong thing. And when I got to the end of it, I realised there is nothing in it for me. It is no good. Oh, what about you? The challenge for us, just like the disciples that were arguing about who the greatest in the Kingdom of God is, they had the wrong goal, they were working for the wrong thing. And Jesus spoke into that and He's saying, boys, you've missed what I'm really about. You've missed the goal of life that if you wanna do the will of God, it's not to do it the way you've been doing it, prioritising the things you've been prioritising. I want you to become the least of these. I want you to look after the nobodies. I want you to wash people's feet. I want you to not be so worried about what looks good in the eyes of the world. For the man looks at the outward things, but God looks at the heart. I wonder, what are you living for? What are you prioritising? What are your goals? Do they have eternal value? Do they have eternal value? Why don't we close our eyes and bow our heads as we reflect on what God's saying to us and the things that really matter. You know, in the Bible, it says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on this earth. There are things that you can work for in this life that look good to other people that that might feel good and give you a sense of accomplishment and security where moth and rust destroy and where thieves may break in and steal. But He says, don't prioritise those things. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Mark 8, for what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? For seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all these things will be given to you. Oh, the Lord is calling us to shed off those pursuits at our own greatness to become the least of these. Oh Lord, would You break our hearts? Would You open up our hearts to the things that You truly care about? The the, the little children, be be like little children. Lord, help us to care about those in our midst, the lowly, those of low status, but the people who You love. Lord, help us to see opportunities to be able to wash each other's feet, to serve each other, even though not only may it not add to our lives, but it might actually cost us dearly and mean that we move backwards and not forwards. But I thank You, Lord, that that is what You demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus. For that is who Jesus is. And as we're standing here today, Jesus was saying these things, not, as, not just as a, a command and giving them a way to live, but He's saying, I want you to understand these truths because when you understand these truths, you understand me. You understand what I'm about. You're understanding that without Jesus, we are spiritual nobodies and that God welcomes us like children, that God treats us as somebodies, that He stooped down, He spent time with us, just like the woman at the well brings us into His family, washed our feet on the cross so that we may have life, so that we may be elevated. And today we stand in His presence, thankful for that gift that He has lifted us up so that we may go and love other people the way He loved. And if you've come in today, you may, might be a guest, somebody invited you along. Maybe it's your first time back in church for a long time and been thinking about your own priorities, your own values, and you realise that they aren't the Kingdom values, they're selfish values, that you're trying to get ahead rather than trying to please God. Today, there's an opportunity to repent. There's a, today, there's an opportunity to let go of those things and say, God, I want You in my life. I wanna receive Your free gift of grace. I wanna live for You alone. Would You forgive me? Would You bring me new life? And if that's you today, you can respond in your heart and say, Jesus, You are Lord. If that's You today, I just invite You to raise Your hand, not so I can embarrass You, not so so anyone else can see, but so I can pray a prayer with You so that 
you can have a chance to respond and I can lead you in a prayer. If that's you today, you say, I don't wanna live for my own agenda anymore. I wanna live for God. If that's you, whether you're an older person, a younger person, you raise your hand, I'd love to include you in a prayer. Saying yes, Jesus. Awesome, awesome. Lord, thank You for those people that You're stirring their hearts today. Lord, that You are realigning their priorities. I thank You, Lord, that You did wash their feet, that You did meet them, although they were bankrupt in their hearts spiritually, that You came to give them grace so that they may have new life. Lord, restore them, rush into their life, give them eternal life and forgiveness, new relationship with You, fill them with Your Holy Spirit. Help them to live a life now for You under Your Master, and and Lordship in Jesus' Name. Amen.